Good evening and welcome to the October 8th Bloomington Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long-range planning and transportation issues. Some items on the Planning Commission we have final decision authority. Others the City Council will make the final decision. Planning Commission is made up of seven volunteers that are appointed by the City Council to serve for up to three-year term. Tonight we have six available. We have three items on the agenda, or sorry, two items on the agenda tonight and minutes uh, to cover. Before we start the meeting tonight, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, Mr. Markegaard, will you uh, go over the protocol for us tonight? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, this is our 12th uh, remote meeting since the pandemic uh, began. And uh, there are just two people here in the chambers tonight, uh, the chairman and myself. Uh, other commissioners and the public and applicants will all be remote. Uh, we do encourage uh, testimony and you can call in uh, at any time. Um, we will have this phone number scrolling across the screen if you're watching on cable television. Uh, the phone number to call would be 952-563-8926, and you'll receive instructions on how to get uh, into the WebEx and be able to testify that way. Or you could email planning at bloomingtonmn.gov. And again, we'll have this scrolling across the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Markergaard. So for those that aren't familiar with the process of the Planning Commission, uh, typically how this works is the Planning Commission, uh, I will ask the, the uh, presenter, um, staff member, to present this, the staff report. And then after the staff report, I'll ask if there's any questions for the um, staff from the Planning Commission. And then we'll go to the applicant for any additional information they may have. And then we'll go to public uh, for comments from the public. After that, if the public has questions and comments during that period, um, the Planning Commission will direct if they want the ap applicant or the uh, staff to answer the questions. But all questions from the public should be directed to the Planning Commission chair or myself. All right, tonight, uh, Mr. Centenario, you have item number one. Can we have the staff report, please? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will uh, share content when I am able. Glenn, can you help me with that? Sure. To the first slide here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, Planning Commission. Uh, the first item on tonight's agenda is uh, a final site and building plan application uh, for an expansion of an existing uh, Verizon wireless facility. Uh, the address is 10801 Bush Lake Road, uh, but it's on the uh, southeast corner of uh, Bush Lake Road in West Old Chocopee. Uh, and Louisiana avenues to the east. I did, I did just pass on this slide momentarily. There was another phone number to call, but I understand that the, the best number to use is scrolling across the screen, so we'll just, we'll just try and be consistent there. So again, uh, this is the site as, as it exists today, uh, an existing telecommunications facility, uh, West of Chalkabee Road, as I mentioned, and Bush Lake Road. Want to touch on uh, the land use designations uh, for this? So this is the how the comprehensive plan designates uh, this particular property. But I also want to highlight the surrounding properties. And so blue is industrial, and so the the land use designation for this property, as well as properties to the south and to the east, are for industrial land uses. Uh, but uh, the Planning commissioners and as well as folks participating uh, will see a, a number of colors uh, and that designates different land uses. So yellow is uh, single family residential. Um, the, the brown, light brown or darker brown is for 
uh, medium or high density residential, so apartments, townhomes, uh, and the like. The pink to the west is a uh, general business, um, and I'll get to the, the zoning districts in just a moment. So I guess the, the, the point here is to identify that there's a variety of, of land uses that are uh, planned uh, for this area. So this is, this is a, a transitional site uh, for various land uses. Going to the zoning, uh, this site, uh, similar to in consistent with the land use designation is for industrial park. Uh, so we, we would anticipate that there would be uh, some level of industry or industrial type uses on the site, as well as uh, surrounding sites to the south and to the, to the east. Uh, there is a, uh, a site to, just to the west uh, that's zoned for uh, a light, lighter industrial, that's actually a car care center. Uh, but you can see to the north, uh, to the northeast, to the northwest, and to the southwest, we have residential uses. The white being uh, single family and the, the brown color being uh, uh, higher density um, townhomes and apartments. So this is the, the site plan that's being proposed uh, by the applicant. And again, this is an existing uh, facility. Uh, it's about 53,000 square feet. Uh, that's in the diagonal uh, hatched area. The proposed expansion is to the north of the existing building. That's highlighted in green. So the, the expansion wouldn't be closer to Bush Lake Road. Uh, it would be built uh, closer to Wessel Shakopee Road. And so that's about a, a 16,700 square foot expansion, mainly a, a data center facility, uh, really not too much in the way of offices or um, you know, workspaces or cubicles, really for, their, for the network uh, systems. And uh, I'll get to some of the more challenging components of this, uh, this project momentarily. Before I do that, uh, we, as part of these reviews, we always deal with parking requirements. And uh, as a you know, industrial facility or a data center, that's a, you know, we use a, a lower ratio because it doesn't really generate that much parking demand. But uh, they are, the applicant is proposing to use a, a, a proof of parking flexibility measure uh, so the area that says area for future parking, 30 spaces, that's uh, an area that they identify for proof of parking. Uh, so they wouldn't uh, build this parking area uh, provided they get approval. But if there appears to be a, a parking issue or they, for some reason, have a lot higher employment than they anticipate, uh, then the city could hypothetically compel them to build these 30 spaces. But uh, as it sits today, uh, they would not under the proof of parking uh, option. That said, you know, with the proof of parking, if we when we account for that, they would exceed the code requirement. And given their uh, operations and their anticipated parking needs, we think this is a good a, a good option for them. Going back to the site plan, kind of zooming into the proposed addition area, uh, you can see the it, it labeled new single story masonry uh, building. And uh, we received quite a bit of uh, public feedback from residents uh, to the north and then and primarily to the north and to the southwest. And a lot of concern is for noise, noise being the, the primary concern, but then also uh, some concern over odors due to their uh, uh, generator testing. But I've highlighted these areas uh, in terms of what would be added to the site. In the kind of the red rectangle, you have uh, air handling units, it's I, I labeled AHU on the plan. Uh, in the green, they're uh, air conditioning condensers. And then in the blue, you see the, the generators. So day one, they would have one uh, new generator or additional generator. The existing generators are within the building. This would be outside of the building. And then they're identifying a potential future uh, second, uh, second generator on the, on the site. So being that noise uh, is, is one of the primary concerns for, uh, for staff and for, for residents, I just wanted to um, include like a, a, a basic graphic of kind of what uh, decibel levels uh, are associated with different, you know, different parts of life, I guess I'll call it. Uh, but you can see it, it's a little small, but um, a quiet room is about 40 decibels, rainfall 50. Uh, an open office, uh, 65 decibels. And uh, you know, I wanted to point this out because the city does have uh, noise standards, and I'll get to some of the challenges with that, but uh, the state does as well. And so this is just a good reference of, of what these sorts of things uh, tend to be uh, relative to, the, to how loud they are. You know, obviously 
uh, snowblower and ambulance siren are, are much louder uh, than what would be uh, permissible in terms of noise long term. So a lot of the concern uh, for this for this site are uh, noise emanating from uh, air handling units, and uh, you know I, I felt it was appropriate just to show what this looks like. Uh, it, it's easy to see on a, a plan the, lo the location of the plan, but the graphic in the upper left is actually the air handling unit that the applicant has spec'd. Um, so these are these are significant uh, pieces of equipment to be sure. Uh, and then you know, the graphic on the right just kind of shows how the air handling unit, just in a very schematic way, uh, you know, uh, uh, moves air uh, to and from the building. The other uh, component related to odor, uh, my understanding is from the generator systems that are inside the building. And on the lower image, this is this is a, just a street view image of the facility itself as it is today. You see the three uh, generator exhaust stacks. And there were there were a lot of uh, issues initially when the facility was built, where uh, too much of the exhaust was directed towards uh, residential areas, and the the applicant at that time, uh, you know, shifted the exhaust 180 degrees and uh, to direct it away from the residents. And I, and I think that helped a, a fair amount. Although I think uh, from time to time when they're doing their testing, there uh, some residents have identified that they can uh, it is impacting. Uh, and they do smell the the odor, uh, the odor when testing. As part of the development application, the applicant did prepare a noise study, and this is something that we, we required as part of the application, mainly because we, we were aware of the, the noise concern and we wanted to uh, have the applicant model the noise uh, to confirm that it was compliant uh, with city code. And, and this is a, I guess, a, a noise heat map, if you will, where the red uh, is the highest level of noise, and it would make sense it's closest to the uh, condensers and the air handling units to the north of the building. And then beyond the noise barrier, which we'll, we'll get into in a moment, uh, the, that noise level drops uh, substantially. So the, uh, the way that uh, they measured uh, did show compliance with MPCA, or Pollution Control Agency requirements. Uh, following their uh, standards and their process. Uh, it was not consistent with city code, um, but as it turns out, there's a, some language in state or state law that prohibits local governments from having more stringent standards. So really when we're talking about compliance with city code, we're, we're related to noise, uh, it's really the state standards that uh, have to be met. And that's what our, our goal as staff is to ensure compliance with, with those state standards. Here's another uh, schematic graphic of the air handling unit. So this isn't a bird's eye view, this is a side view where you see the air handling unit AHU and then those red lines just to, you know, is a, a graphical representation of, of sound. And uh, really the, the um, relative to the general public, the air handling units are surrounded by a wall and then another wall. There is an initial barrier wall that ha is proposed to have some uh, noise, sound absorption material as part of that wall. Uh, so that would be uh, that would mitigate a good, great deal of noise. And then uh, a secondary wall, uh, which would be more uh, public facing on the north side and the east side, uh, would be a, a masonry a block, a block wall. So that would also have some uh, noise mitigation impacts, but then also provides screening for their outdoor equipment and for general security. So I mentioned uh, some state law that does apply to us and our, our legal staff did review this, but uh, so the, the Pollution Control Agency or MPCA uh, stipulates that they are in charge of uh, establishing standards for noise. And, they all, and so they uh, preempt uh, local government from having more stringent standards than the state. Uh, so uh, staff, we're, we're aware of this and, and staff is working on amendments to be consistent with state law. But generally speaking, it, uh, it's the it's the state rules that we have to that the applicant and staff have to work with. That being said, again, uh, the noise study and and uh, we imagine that members of the public have some questions about the noise study. The applicants, uh, acoustic engineer uh, engineers, are available for questions tonight, and so we think their their feedback would be uh, beneficial and 
providing a little more uh, uh, explanation for how the study works and how it relates to existing uh, the existing facility as it stands today. Some other elements of the uh, project include landscaping. There's quite a bit of landscaping that uh, has to be removed to make way for the building expansion. And uh, that landscaping has to be replaced. We have code requirements for the number of trees and shrubs uh, on a particular site. And uh, the applicant's landscape plan, which I'm showing on, uh, on screen, uh, far exceeds the shrub requirement, uh, but they are deficient on trees. And so we think it'd be a good idea uh, to have to locate uh, as many trees as possible along that north frontage, uh, not only just to break up the appearance appearance of a black wall, but then over time, you know, there could be some um, some potential uh, noise mitigation uh, with m mature trees. Looking a little closer at this northwest corner, so this is the corner of West Old Chocopee and Bush Lake Road. You can see the the building addition and the air handling units. So a lot of uh, shrubs and smaller uh, smaller plantings along the security wall. Uh, but then there's not much that's being proposed, nothing being proposed between that uh, that area and the sidewalk. Uh, so we need to we would need to fill that in a little bit with trees because they are they are deficient. The building elevations that they're proposing uh, they're proposing a, a a brick building expansion. Um, so that that's certainly compliant with city codes uh, exterior material standards. So the image on uh, the lower image identify or depicts the north elevation uh, behind the wall. So you can see those air handling units. Um, so they are, again, they're quite big. Uh, they wouldn't be visible from the street uh, that the screen walls would 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 screen the air handling units uh, from from the public. Uh, but then the upper image is uh, depicts the how that block wall would be would be implemented. And really, it'd be quite similar to what's the, what's out there right now. And so I have a the street view image of what what that wall looks today looks like today, but obviously it would be much closer to the uh, to Westville Chalkby Road. Still compliant with city code in terms of setbacks, uh, but it would be much closer to the street. Uh, with that, we are we are recommending approval uh, subject to a number of conditions that were included in the packet, and we we tried to address uh, via conditions the concerns that uh, residents have about noise um, and. We can go through what our proposed language is, uh, but essentially we, we want to uh, ensure compliance with MPCA requirements and uh, also ensure that our environmental health staff uh, have the opportunity to inspect and review the uh, how the generators exhaust systems would work, try and mitigate any sort of odor problems. Uh, but the Planning Commission is the approval authority for this project and that's the applicant is not seeking any deviations or variances. Uh, and they're subject to a three business day appeal period. And I have a, a recommended motion for you below. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commission members, are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, one question I have for you, uh, Mr. Simpsonario, is really around the generators themselves. Are these diesel generators? Um, first question, and then what type of mitigation um, muffler, uh, catalytic converter type of devices are on these types of generators to help mitigate the, the odor and the noise? I'll take my question offline. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner. The, the generators are diesel, and uh, so they've, uh, they're really a, a public safety element uh, to having generators at this type of facility uh, in the event of an emergency and uh, power is lost through the, you know, the, the general electrical system, they would need to run their generators to, to maintain operations at the facility. So there is, uh, they are diesel and uh, they do have, uh, they would have tanks with fuel on site. Uh, they are, they are uh, enclosed. The generators itself are, are self-enclosed. Um, so the, the noise is essentially uh, mitigated with its own enclosure. In terms of the exact uh, uh, technical details of the muffling system for the exhaust stacks, I'd, I'd have to we'd have to ask the applicant on how that's how that's done. Um, but again, uh, self-contained uh, enclosures, and then uh, yes, it is diesel. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Not seeing any. 
Um, we, I believe we have the applicant uh, online. Would they like to speak? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm told that uh, Jim Pennebecker and uh, Andrew Schmitz are, Schmidt is available, and I will make Mr. Schmidt a panelist. I don't see the other name on the list. Is he unmuted? Uh, Mr. Schmidt, you can unmute yourself if you'd oh. like to speak. Um, I think, is Jim Penemecker on call or on the web chat? Uh, and I know Tony Baxter with ESI Engineering is also on the call. Um, we didn't okay, could be a, I will promote Tony Baxter here. And then we have a couple call-in users if you happen to know that area code they might be calling from. Pull that up right now. Jim is. Is 410 area code. I don't see that here. Uh, 647 and a 510. Let me check in with those two area codes. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, who, who are we looking for? from the applicant team? Uh, Jim Panabecker. Okay. With Marcin Hirschfield, the architects on the, on the project. What was that last name? Panabecker, P-A-N-N-E-B-E-C-K-E-R. All right, thank you. Um, I will unmute the caller from area code 647. And just checking in with a caller from area code 647 to see if this is uh, Mr. Panabecker. Didn't hear a response there. I'll check in with the area code 510. You are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, is this is this Mr. Panabecker? Jim Panabecker with Morrison oh, Hershey. Yes. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead, Mr. Pannebecker. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, um, we are representing um, Verizon, just to explain a little bit about the, the, uh, their, the rationale for the expansion is, uh, you, know, the, you know, they provide the, the wireless services. Um, their existing facility is running at full capacity as it is and in order to maintain service and continue to grow and, and expand into the uh, the 5G uh, network uh, that's underway. Um, that's what requires the additional uh, data center space. Uh, and the facility is, is basically a, a 7,000 square foot uh, computer room uh, supported by a UPS and electrical rooms. Um, all of the systems that we're putting in are, are redundant. So even though you see a good bit of equipment. It it's not all running at the same time because there's there's a uh, there's always a, a, at least one uh, backup system uh, in reserve to allow for uh, maintenance or or something uh, mechanical or electrical issue with that piece of equipment. Um, so that uh, you know during that the the, the building remains uh, ready to go in the event of a, a, a storm or power outage or something. Uh, the facility, uh, you know, can can continue to operate and provide the services. Um, the generators, I know <clears throat> there's been some some concern uh, raised, uh, and we've been uh, addressing that. Um, 
the generators are uh, they're they're all EPA tier two compliant, which is the current uh, federal uh, guidelines requirements uh, for generators. Um, we are looking to enhance the the exhaust in response to some of the, the, the comments that we've uh, recently received. Um, uh, what we're looking at right now in order to to improve the current situation or improve, make sure that we don't make anything worse is to um, uh, turn the exhaust uh, similarly to what the, uh, the original generators were modified so that the exhaust is, is discharged toward south away from the residential areas, as well as uh, extend the, uh, the stacks uh, higher than what they normally would be uh, when this was not an issue, because that gets it up into the airflow uh, better and we can, uh, you know, it disperses any fumes that are generated. Um, since, you know, a, gener a diesel engine is running, uh, we can't, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we can do, you know, we can we can uh, clean out so much of that, um, but it's still a diesel uh, engine. Um, so, so we're taking steps that we can to, um, you know, to to improve on on what would typically be installed um, with with an installation like this. The generators are in an acoustical enclosure, um, which greatly reduces any noise that's coming from those generators, so that uh, you know. Get, by the time any sound uh, that would be uh, reaching that screen wall, um, it will have very uh, minimal impact. We think on uh, you know beyond that point, given the uh, the reduction of noise from from those uh, acoustic enclosures that they'll be be housed in. Um, and, and I think uh, we touched on earlier the the air handling units. We have um, there's two screen walls that we provided. There's the the northernmost masonry screen wall that was uh, uh, sized to to be taller than the uh, than the equipment is in order to to you know control the sound as well as screen the uh, equipment. And then we also uh, have installed a uh, on, within a few feet of the uh, the air handlers. There are is a, is a a specially uh, uh, acoustic absorbent uh, screen wall that encloses those air handlers on 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 the three sides uh, and um, greatly reduces the amount of noise that uh, that those units will be given off and and that's what allowed us to uh, to keep those units uh, you know within the uh, prescribed requirements and and on a note just along um uh, along that, the screen wall to the north of that, uh, we have added in response to the comments that we received uh, from the planning department, uh, to additional landscaping and some trees uh, all along that uh, that northern wall. So that will be uh, be screened and 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 uh, yeah, uh, made more attractive uh, than and then just the the, the bare wall that. Uh, it would uh, potentially be. So uh, we have added in the uh, the additional trees and, and added a, dish, a good bit of landscaping along that north side uh, to try to, uh, to address that issue again. And I think that uh, you know, would pretty much, uh, I think, summarizes uh, what, what we're proposing to do. Thank you, Mr. Pannerbecker. This is uh, Chairman Solberg. I, just a question for you. I thought I heard you say something. I want to verify. Um, you were mentioning about the air handling units and that you have a, um, a specialty acoust uh, acoustic wall on both sides. Are, are you referring to um, the what would be on the north side of the air handling units and then on the, I guess, the south, the building expansion? Or what were you referring to? Well, there's a, there's a the building is to the south of, of the units. Uh, they attach to the building. Um, to the north, the east, and the west. Uh, it's hard to see on that that plan that that was just up there because uh, it was kind of underneath the red line where he had outlined the, uh, the air handlers. But it's a uh, it's a screen wall that's uh, five feet taller than the uh, than the units. Uh, and it's it's made of a uh, 
a, a you know an acoustically absorbent. Uh, it's specifically designed just to absorb and control sound in instances like this. It's the same wall that uh, that Verizon had installed over by the generators, so it's the same product. Uh, and so that uh, that wall closest to the the air handlers uh, was was added. <clears throat> Uh, after we did the initial acoustic study and, and determined that uh, you know the, the masonry screen wall was not providing the the, uh, the ad adequate uh, control, we added these the second uh, sound absorbing wall that was closer to the unit on the on the other sides. Okay, so just to clarify, then that's on the north, east, and west sides of of the air handling units. Is that what? I just want to make sure I, I'm understanding yes, where that's the correct. is. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the applicant at this point? Um, Commissioner Cookton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. A uh, question for the applicant and specifically to the applicant's acoustics engineer, um, if they're available. Uh, the study addressed the new equipment here in regards to the decibel level that's allowed, but it wasn't clear to me whether that study included any existing noise that was coming out of the site. And so I'm wondering if the applicant's uh, acoustics engineer could, could verify whether the existing conditions were taken into account in that study. Yes, this is Tony Baxter with ESI. Uh, there is, in our experience and from what we've seen there, um, the generate, the existing generators are the primary noise source on the north side of the building. And they don't, they don't, they're not normally running. Um, so the, the noise from those generators was not included, was not added to this new noise. We can consider that, um, and, and we can do that, um, but it wasn't done in this report, in the study. Commissioner Cookdown, does that answer your question, or? Um, a follow-up, if I may, Mr. Okay. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so am I to understand that there's essentially, other than the generator, which only runs periodically, am I to understand that there is no noise coming from the existing facility? Um, in our experience, correct. In the north side of the building, uh, there there are there are some very small condensing units that are there, but uh, they they contribute very little noise. They're very low behind the screen wall. The the there are there's other equipment that's on the south side of the building, but that that noise doesn't that noise is not um, does not make it to the to the north side and, and to Old Shock if you will. Commissioner Cookdown, anything else? Uh, if I may, just one further point of clarification, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, so it would be your opinion that the small amount of noise coming from the existing facility would not affect the map we're seeing on the screen here or push us over the decibel level that's allowed? I'll give it. I'll give it more thought. Um, my my initial uh, response to you is correct that, that it's that it's not it's not going to contribute significantly to these noise levels that we have. It's not. Okay. Anything yes. else, Commissioner Cookton? No. All right, uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have a question regarding the generator testing. Uh, how often is that completed? And then what is the duration of the testing? Is that uh, uh, an hour or two hours? How long does that testing take? This is uh, Jim Pennebecker. They test the generators on Wednesday afternoons for a, a, approximately two hours total between the, for the existing generators. Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead, go ahead. And, and so you uh, just a clarification question that happens every Wednesday? That's correct. <clears throat> Thank you. All right.
right. Uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, one of my questions that I have is really around the use of the building itself. Um, with this expansion, uh, Mr. Centenario had mentioned that uh, additional proof of parking would be um, required, um, but not needed at this time. So one of the questions I have is really just around um, how many employees are, will be at this facility? Does that, is that plan to increase with the new expansion? Um, additionally, what are the hours um, that those employees are at the building? So I'm just trying to look at how many people are in and out of this building. Could that be a contributing factor to some of the noise or um, uh, movement throughout the facility um, in addition to these generators? Okay, this is Jim Pennebecker again. Um, currently, there's probably, given the, the COVID-19 and, and all the office staff is, is, is working remotely, um, there's approximately six staff that are involved in operating the facility and, and maintaining uh, the, 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 the data center portion. There's approximately 30 people that, uh, that work in the office area. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, that is not uh, uh, not a number that's going to to be changing because we are not modifying the office space. That, uh, sufficient. Uh, if I may, um, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, what are the hours of these employer employees? Are they staffed around the clock, or are they uh, typical? Nine to five hours. The the the, the thirty staff uh, office staff are the typical nine to five office. Uh, there's there's in the bulk of them the uh, the engineering staff is there during the day. There's there's probably two people there um, overnight just to monitor and, and maintain the uh, the systems. Great. Thanks for the clarification. Any additional questions for the applicant at this point? All right, I just I I do have one additional uh, question, and it really um, I'm going to ask you to go back because the uh, this is uh, regarding the noise and it, it, so the exist or the modeling that was provided only uh, dealt with the new addition or new equipment and. I think we've heard quite a little um, bit from neighboring uh, residents that there is noise that exists now. I, I don't have a real good sense if that's constant noise or if that's peak period type noise. Um, so can, can you give me a little bit more about how you would do existing modeling with this on top or uh, how that may affect um, this modeling that we have here in front of us. Hey, this is Tony Baxter with ESI again. Um, we probably wouldn't model the existing noise. We would go measure it. Okay. Uh, we, would, we would measure the existing noise levels. Um, you know, there's the source... The primary source on the north side, in my experience, is the generators on Wednesday afternoons when they test them. The, the requirement for the noise is, 50, is 60 dBA. Um, is 60 dBA to the daytime. Let me check that here. Yeah, it's 50, it's 50 dBA at night and 60 dBA during the daytime. So. We, our calculations and our contour plot, we're, we're evaluating the noise from the new equipment to the 50 dBA requirement for nighttime. The generators, when they're tested, um, um, need, need to meet the 60 dBA requirement. So, so again, I, I still, I don't think that this equipment is going to add significantly to, to, even when the generators are running, um, they're going to add significantly to the, to the noise that's in the neighborhood. But to answer your question directly, we, we would we would we would measure um, the noise in, in the in those locations and, and add that to this to this contour plot. 
Yeah, and the, again, part of the reason I ask is I look at that that little X on the uh, graphic in front of us, and um, while there's not a scale to this, it looks like it's relatively close to residents. And if the uh, modeling or the, I guess, is it MPCA requirements are, are 50 feet or 50 decibels at um, the residents or at their uh, area of, of occupation, I don't I think there's some difference there, right, um, of usable space from from residents. I, I just want to make sure that we fully understand that from a planning commission standpoint uh, as we move forward. So that's that's why I asked that question. I don't know that I, I need a response on that at this point. But um, are there any other questions for, for uh, the applicant? All right. Uh, thank you uh, for that information. Um, Mr. Markergaard, do we have uh, any individuals that are calling in tonight? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do. We have four uh, individuals who have registered and another two who have said they may want to speak. So we'll start tonight uh, with a Mr. Gary uh, Jurin, and I will unmute you now. Uh, he was. There we go. Uh, just saw. There we go. Okay, you are unmuted. Oh, good evening. Uh, can good you hear evening. me? We can. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um. Say. Uh. Yes. So uh, my name is Gary. Uh, Garen. Uh. I'm a professional engineer. Uh. Retired. And I live on the second cul-de-sac north of Old Shakopee Road. Um, first question I have is, how much time do I get here to discuss? And I mean, do I get two minutes or do I get 15 if I need it? Well, I uh, so we do have four other people. So if you could limit uh, your initial discussion to five minutes. I'll give you five minutes as it's only uh, right now I understand four people. And then if there's more to cover afterwards, we can come back to you. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip over my, I, I had submitted a three page commentary letter. Yes, we received it. Um, okay. So I'm going to skip over the first paragraph uh, in uh, to save time here to get to uh, some substantial issues. So I just heard some questions asked about, I, I, I wish I could interject at the times the questions were being asked and answered, but I heard a question about, are we going to model the existing equipment um, simultaneously with the new equipment? And I heard the answer was no, but we could add it in by measuring. Um, and I guess, gentlemen, the generators are a once a week issue during the daytime. That, that's separate. The other issue is the auxiliary handling units, which are running 24-7, 365 days a year. They never stop. And they, because they have a, a sound wall built around them, it, it's obvious they're very noisy. Um, I live the second cul-de-sac up. On any cold winter night, I can step out into my cul-de-sac and I can hear those fans running like nobody's business. If I wake up at two in the morning to go use the restroom, because I'm 62 years old and I come back to bed, I can't get to sleep because I hear the constant hum, hum of these blowers through the cold of the night. And it's caused, sound goes up, but when it hits a cold temperature inversion, it diffracts down. And it hits the back side of my house like somebody's talking right outside my window. And I believe it is at least 50 dB, at least. And this is with the equipment 
that currently resides on the south side of the building. Um, so you're gonna add an equivalent amount of equipment, just visually looking, an equivalent amount of equipment, air handling units, to the north side of the building with no more protection than we have on the south side. So the limited amount that I know about uh, um, noise and how to add decibels and that, 50 plus 50 in the DB world means it's gonna be 53, okay? That's how it adds, it's a logarithmic thing. Um, and also the refraction amplifies these sound waves are compressed. And if you've ever sat on the other side of a lake for a bunch of people on a cold night and you can hear their conversation, right? You're sitting next to their fire. That's how sound travels in the dead of night. So that's, those are my concerns. Okay. Um, real quick. Um, so yeah, about I, two minutes I, left. I, 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 I suspect you will not make the 50 dB uh, criteria. Um, I'm asking for a detailed testing program um, at various temperatures and wind conditions at various times between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. because that's when old Shakopee is quiet. That's when I can sleep. But I can't sleep because I have to listen to these things howl. Um, and at various locations, I'd like to see these tests done. A one and done test done five feet somewhere on the ground on a nice sunny day next to, isn't going to cut it because that's not the issue. The issue is the other 200 nights of the year and the 120 nights when it's really cold and this sound travels and it hits my bedroom window. And lastly, I would invite anybody on this panel, anybody on the city council or whatever, to come and stand and listen to it through my bedroom window on said cold night. Uh, one other thing, um, somebody earlier on in your Q&A said, there is no other equipment. Uh, no, there is. Um, Obviously, all the equipment on the south side. So I say south side plus north side is going to equal more than what's in the model. And the topography of our area is an upland from this area. So any of that sound that makes it over that wall is unabated right to the back of our homes. The last thing on the generators, um, they are tested every Wednesday and the tests start this morning woke me up at, I usually get up to feed the dogs, but I didn't this morning. Anyways, the generators woke me up at 7.15 a.m. this morning. And the generators were howling and still running at 1 p.m. this afternoon. So to say that the tests start in the afternoon is a misstatement. And to say they only run for two hours is a misstatement. All right. Thank you, Mr. Guerin. Is there is there anything else? That was five minutes. Uh, you know, I would say those are the high points. The only other thing would be 50 DBA. Um, if you go to the World World Health Organization, 40 DBA is considered uh, a nighttime noise level conducive to human health and um, mental health. Constant, uninterrupted 40 dBA, not 50. So, and a 10 dBA change from 50 down to 40 um, is perceived as having, cutting in half the sound level, is perceived by a human as half the sound level. All right. Well, I would, I would ask, that Verizon uh, look at, there are, there are many more sound attenuation measures they could take. They could try All right, thank you, Mr. Guerin. Okay. Is anything else substantial to add to this or I can bring you back after the other speakers? Uh, thank you, Glenn, right, appreciate thank, it. Thank you, okay. uh, Glenn. 
can we, or Mr. Markgaard, can we have the next one? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, our next speaker is uh, Gemma Miller. I will unmute you now. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I didn't know you were going to be picking me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, my concern has to do with the landscaping. And I know that right now that uh, Verizon is not um, in code right now. And they did talk about that earlier. Uh, my big question is, is right now along the sidewalk area on Old Shakopee, there is a row of very mature trees. They're some of the most mature on the whole property. And is there any way those can stay mm. um, at this point? At least that row of, there's about nine of them. Um, because a mature tree is going to help out in the situation from the get-go much better than a younger tree that's shorter. And also, it's just, you know, keeping... The model that you have now they're beautiful and it bothers me that those would be probably bulldozed over you know the whole lot would be bulldozed over in that area so um is that possible that that can be kept there okay well we can check into that okay was there anything else you'd like to uh let us know no not on that subject okay all right. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right. Mr. Markegaard, do we have uh, another speaker? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our next caller is uh, Linda Fletcher, and I will unmute you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I have submitted in writing um, uh, my concerns, and I think what I'd like to do is uh, just read them to you. They are quite brief, but I feel significant. And uh, if that will be all right with you, absolutely, that's what I'd go like ahead. To do. Okay, all right, <laughs> here we go. The major problem of this application is a reoccurring one: noise. As currently designed, this building has been a continued disturbance to the surrounding residential neighborhoods. The proposal before you imagines the addition of four fans plus a fifth in reserve. How can this scenario possibly alleviate the already existing problem, noise? The property owners in the area require a detailed answer to this question. We are the persons who will be forced to live with the situation, not the applicant. Here is another unasked and therefore unanswered question. If the noise problem persists, what is the redress for those living near the facility? How can the predicament be corrected once the expansion has been completed? We need to know what rights we have. Yesterday, I received yet another notification of a Verizon application. This one for a 30-foot tower on the same property. Are these two applications connected? Can one work without the other? Again, these questions must be satisfactorily answered before a final decision is reached. Due to the serious and permanent effect of this proposal, property owners, including myself, will be filing an appeal to the Bloomington City Council should the Planning Commission decide to approve this application in its present form. Thank you for your consideration of my concerns. Thank you. Did you was there anything besides the letter you'd like to add on that as well? Um, no, um, but I feel the, the questions that I have asked need, need satisfactory responses. All right, thank you. We'll... Uh, we'll Planning Commission will it. look at what needs to be addressed from the decision-making process and move with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do we have any additional speakers at this time, Mr. Markegaard? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have an additional speaker. And I'm sorry we missed the last name, but uh, Molly, uh, Colin, user 5, I will unmute you now. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Good evening. Appreciate this opportunity. Good evening, um, Mr. Centenario and the Planning Commission. 
Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Molly Lon. I've been a Bloomington resident my entire life, 45 plus years. Um, I've lived on Bush Lake Road here, right across the street um, for over 15 years. I am also, uh, Mr. Pennebaker, a Verizon customer as well. And I think Verizon actually does a fabulous job. But um, I just want to echo some of these concerns. Sound pollution is number one for sure. I'm concerned about um, potentially increased traffic to some degree. I did, you know, hear you describing there's not going to be a whole lot of potentially extra employees. Um, I'm concerned about resale value of my home um, because I, uh, to, 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 to kind of say this in a right-brained way, I kind of don't want my front yard to become a big concrete um, area with um, diesel engines um, because basically I, live, I do live directly across the street and it um, has a huge impact on just sort of quality of life knowing that that's what's across the street. Um, Gemma, also, I totally agree about the trees. Um, so visual pollution is a big piece. The sound, I really want to also second um, my Bloomington neighbor, uh, the gentleman that just spoke about how the sound goes up. So this is the human experience of living across the street. Numbers of decibels aside, what the experience is like is as soon as the weather turns cold, like the gentleman mentioned, it is a constant drone all winter long that never stops. So I have to keep windows closed. I, uh, it, it's uncomfortable when you step outside. It's like this constant intrusive uh, presence. It is also correct that it goes up. So about where these decibels are being measured from, because on the upper level of my townhouse, it is much lower very prominent. So if I'm sitting up like in my loft working on, on my computer or something, I basically have to have music on, I have to have some kind of distraction because that sound is constant all winter long. And so the idea of expanding it is um, is rather frightening. I did reach out to the city a number of years ago started and I didn't really get a resolution of it. So Basically, what I'm saying is I have concerns about the sound level as things are right now that ideally really would be addressed. Um, and so the idea of expanding the facility, I'm very much in support of this being appealed because uh, it's going to have a very significant impact on quality of life visually, um, from an auditory perspective, from a resale value perspective. Um, I think, yeah, my... Yeah, my request is definitely that this goes to an appeal at this point. I think, I think those are the main um, comments that I have, and I, you know, I'm just kind of a gut level. I, I, this is again, it's just I'm speaking from my guts here, but I feel like Verizon, a, a national giant corporation, they've got tons of resources to work with, and I think that there is a viable solution apart from expanding in my front yard, basically. So, thank you for your service, I think you guys are fabulous, um, and thank you for the, to, the, um, to the Bloomington Commission here for allowing our voices to be heard. I really appreciate it, and um, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. And just to uh, clarify, you, you, your uh, residence is um, to the west of the facility. Is that what you said? Yep, I live at one hundred nine one six. So I'm in the villa directly across the street. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and yep. thank you for the comments. Thank you. All right. Do we have anybody else that's uh, now registered? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is just one other. Uh, phone number on our list that we haven't uh, checked in with. So uh, call in user 12, area code 510. I will unmute you now. Call in user 12. Would you like to testify on item number one? All right, I'm not hearing... Uh, desire for testimony there. Let's check in with Mr. Pease. Okay. And just verify that, uh, Mr. Pease, do we have any other additional uh, callers interested in speaking? No other callers. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, hearing the testimony in front of us, do any of the Planning Commission members have any additional questions at this point before uh, for applicant or um, any of the callers that were in front of us? No questions. Not seeing any questions. Um, I am. I do have a question for the applicants, um, engineers, and that uh, just to go back. Just the question: uh, Is there a difference, or um, I think going back to our first caller, Mr. Guerin, is there a difference in time or season? Uh, that's regulated by the noise monitoring or when it's modeled? Yeah, this is Tony Baxter again with ESI. Um, is, is, there, is there your question is, do we consider different seasons when we do our calculations? Different yeah, that, that sounds like a much better way than I put it. Uh, The, the answer is um, the answer is no. We don't consider season. What we what we have done in this case is we've taken the very worst case condition for the for the source levels, which is all five units running simultaneously at their loudest condition, which which isn't a real condition. It's um, all five won't run at the same time. Um, but we want to be the um, we want worst case conditions. We want a high number. Um, and, and in our modeling, um, the the way the equations work, they consider um, they consider winds that are moderately favorable to propagation, uh, and 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 they consider um, a moderate level of temperature inversion. This what Mr. Yearn has referred to as this uh, kind of reflection from the atmosphere back down. It does include, um, it, it does include that. It doesn't include it as the worst case, but it includes some effect of that. So I think that we do cover, um, we do cover the worst season, which is, which is winter. Um, maybe not to the, to the, to the, to the, to the worst extent, but we do consider it. And we do consider winds that are somewhat favorable to propagation. Okay, so it, and is there a uh, just to clarify? I think you were the term was moderate level and uh, winds. It, what does that What does that mean? I think I think this is part of what the the um, again some of the detail that helps us understand how that modeling works and what the impact is for the neighborhood. Right. The, the, the favorable winds are, are is, is a downwind propagation of the noise, um, and the wind speeds are generally referred to as speeds between two miles an hour and eleven miles an hour. Okay. You can have higher winds certainly from the south. Um, but the other thing that happens in higher winds is you get you know, the trees are making noise, or there are other noise sources. Um, <clears throat> so, so which tend to kind of mask this noise too. So. So this this is the, the um, kind of the standard way of, of of forming these calculations. Okay. And temperature is that? Do you have, is there a range on that? What it models at? There isn't. It, it, the the method is just says it's a moderate temperature inversion. So it does it does include some effect of the sound being held down or reflected back down. Okay. All right. Um, just a. Uh, uh, an additional couple of questions here, I think, um, and maybe it's not necessarily for you, but maybe it's uh, for Mr. Pennebecker and, and the discussion that we heard uh, concern about landscaping and is the plan allow um, the ability to keep some of those larger trees in the, uh, I guess it would be the, the north side of the property? Yes, um, <clears throat> I think um, without looking at the, the current drawings we're keeping, I think approximately half of the trees, um, there's a water main that goes up through there, uh, and, we're re and then we are replacing uh, 
more trees than what we're removing. Obviously, they're not will not be as mature uh, as as the what, trees that are there. Um, but we have gone back uh, since uh, our last uh, meeting with the city and have added additional landscaping along that side. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like Commissioner Goldsman, you have a question. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess the the question around trees is one that I had. Um, so thank you for the answer. The second question I had was around uh, the second application that the um, the resident referred to um, it, the, with the tower, and just wanted to understand: um, Are these two um, requests connected in any any way um, that the tower would? would uh, be contingent on this new data center, et cetera. So um, just the question about the tower uh, application and uh, how it's connected to this one. Uh, this is Jim Pennebecker. Uh, I am not aware of, of any, an application for the tower, so that must be a completely separate uh, application. Um, if I can, do staff, you have a, a idea of what that is? I think we've gone through some other 30 foot towers. I just yeah, can clarify. Uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, we do have an application from Verizon at this site for a 30 foot tower. The tower would be on the southeastern portion of the site. Uh, whether or not there's a relationship between the addition and the tower, I'm not sure. And maybe Mr. Centenario knows that, but they are two separate applications and the tower is coming to your next uh, planning commission meeting. Okay, thank you. Mr. Centenario, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I really don't have much to add. Uh, <clears throat> they are entirely independent applications, um, at least from the, li the little bit I've gathered from my, my colleague in the office. Um, I believe it actually has some to do with uh, research and development at the facility. So uh un unrelated uh to our knowledge uh, relative to the data center data center expansion that's before you tonight okay thank you there are uh any additional questions at this point um from any of the planning commission members all right not seeing any um i would entertain a motion to close the public hearing Commissioner Cookton. Motion to close the public hearing. All right. And Commissioner Albrecht. Second. All right. Commissioner Cookton with a motion to close public hearing. Commissioner Albrecht with a second. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself. Motion passes. Public hearing is now closed. Discussion um, from Planning Commission members. Any thoughts? Uh, Commissioner Roman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the letters we've received from members of the community, the comments we've heard tonight. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because, well, well we always um, welcome and, and take into account that feedback. I think it's important to know that the, the members of the community know how little ability we have to influence this, especially on the noise piece. Um, the telecommunication industry has some pretty good lobbyists who managed to get the state to take away local control on this in many ways. We see this when we get cell towers, and now we see this when it comes to noise. Uh, he has better standards than this on noise, and we can't do anything about it. Um, so uh, I, I want to just, I want that out there for the, for the people who brought forward these questions and concerns to know that um, our, uh, what, what comes out of this or what we're required to act on um, is not necessarily what the city standards might be. Um, I think I have my the main thing that's holding me up right now that I do think is a legitimate thing is that um, that the noise modeling is based only on the equipment that's that's proposed uh, and that it's not overlapping with the existing conditions. 
And, you know, we heard from members of the community about the winter noise. That's real. Um, I used to live uh, under the airport. And when the temperature got below zero, the airport sounded a lot different. Uh, and so I, I believe that the things that they're bringing us are, are real and legitimate. And so the fact that we've noise modeled some, or we've been brought noise modeling that only takes us in isolation, um, I have a hard time uh, go on only based on that. Um, the other areas, again, reasonable uh, objections from the, the community. I just want them to know that um, the city is has its hands tied and has had its local control usurped by um, the legislature. So uh, that's where we're at on that. I think, um, you know, I, the sounds like the, the amount of generator testing sounds like it's more than uh, than we are told. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if there's, you know, clearly they use diesel generators instead of natural gas, which would have had different um, odor effects on the neighbors, uh, lesser, I would assume. Um, and again, I don't know if two hours is the industry standard or if that's the, we have to burn this fuel every so often. And so two hours is what it takes to burn before the fuel goes bad and we restock it. I don't know what the logistics are about that, but that's a business logistics. That's not a that's not uh, what's required to make sure the generator works. So, um, again, I think my main, I would like to see more of that. I'm be open to hear other people's thoughts on is whether or not we're comfortable with the noise modeling that does not take into account other noise from the site. All right. Thank you. Are there any additional comments uh, from commissioners on this, on this item before us? Commissioner Cookton. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too am uncomfortable with the um, modeling that has been done with the uh, absence of existing conditions being modeled. Um, it's our understanding that they're low, but um, as it was pointed out, we are right at the limit at the properties to the north and even a low amount of noise could push us over the edge. And we're also hearing that it could be more than a low amount of noise, particularly during the winter. And so I too am uncomfortable with the um, lack of of existing conditions being in the model. Uh, furthermore, if if we were to, you know, depending on what this commission decides and if there are conditions, et cetera, um, I would like further information on, you know, what inputs are being used into this model as far as, as weather and season and temperature, um, recognizing that we're modeling here and it's not a necessarily a measured you know, type of a situation, it's a model. And so there are inputs in a model and similar to a traffic model, you're you're somewhat limited on, you know, on the information you have and you're modeling it. And I, I recognize that, but I think it's, you know, important to understand it, you know, with a little bit more clarity, what is industry standard when we're talking about um, temperature and season and, you know, what type of, you know, are we using just industry standard or is there, you know, other options and, and what codes are we using to, you know, how much of a recurrence interval or conservatism, et cetera, is in that engineering design. Um, as an engineer myself, I have a curiosity to that. And I think it's important to understand, are we talking about an average average fall day or an average winter day? Because we have a lot of winter here. And I think the residents have expressed that. And I think it's important for us to understand that information better. So uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Commissioner Cookton. Uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to echo uh, what the commissioners have already said and just add on that um, I have an additional concern about the generator testing in conjunction with the air handling units and the noise that that makes all at once during that testing. Um, my understanding that the testing was done giving the five air handling units, but if those are being if those are running at the same time that the generators are being tested, what is what does that look like? What is the sound pollution um, that would occur because of that? Uh, I I too am concerned about that and um, and the ability to move this forward. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments by any other commissioners at this point? 
Commissioner Gorman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also uh, feeling a kind of a uncomfortable about this. Um, you know, if we receive those comments um, via email and also as we hear uh, members of the public tonight, uh, residents, um, I, I cannot even imagine, you know, if you're already experiencing discomfort with the with the level of the noise, um, then as, as we look further into um, this expansion, you know, what, what this would mean for the residents. Um, so also agree that it would be uh, best if we can um, have more information in terms of um, different seasons and times and when those tested, when the testing is being done as well. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Goldsman. Commissioner Goldsman, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think I would just echo most of the, or all of the other um, planning commission members' uh, comments. Uh, the thing that I think about too I, is just about um, this is on quite a, a busy road. Old Shakopee Road has a lot of road noise and probably drones out a lot of um, the fan noise from this facility during the day. Um, but I think the concerns from the residents at night is, is valid. Um, without that car noise, they're going to hear the hum of that fan. Um, the other thing that I, I'm looking at as well is understanding the generator usage is 715 to one. Um, we wanna make sure that we, we fully understand how long those generators are gonna be tested for. Um, and then make sure that um, that the diesel engines are, are maintained to to meet the, the tier two emission compliance. There's a lot of great technologies out there to minimize the exhaust fumes um, uh, from these engines. Um, and thinking about having those run for so long and exposure to uh, contaminants, particulate matter and ozone, uh, NOx, et cetera, uh, to those residents for such a long period of time concerns me. Um, so I, I would agree that um, we should make sure we take into account the existing facility as well as uh, the new expansion um, at those core, you know, winter night hours really to understand the impact to the residents. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Corman, do you have another comment or is your hand just still up? <laughs> All right, I'll take that. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, no additional comments at this point. Um, did did uh, anybody else, any uh, additional thoughts? I'll, uh, I'll just add mine in here as well. I think, you know, initially kind of looking at this application, um, I was thinking, well, these air handlers with some mitigation um, and the, the noise model uh, had the um, ha, ha, was showing that it, it, it's close to this uh, compliance. So it started out with just a bit of a question. Uh, and now we're learning a little bit more about the generators in use uh, from the residents around. And uh, I'm, I am concerned, just like the other commissioners, that we're not getting the full aspect of what the noise will be generated from this facility. I think the other point that I don't want to lose sight of is, yes, the generators um, are maybe tested, maybe they're two hours, maybe they're four hours. I don't, uh, we don't know the, the exact details on that. But what we do have to understand is that these are backup generators and they will be uh, potentially in use for a long time if there is uh, a need for them. So that is uh, potentially an impact to the neighborhood. Uh, I think for us to just consider them as, as testing once a week uh, would be a bit short-sighted. Um, so I think there's that. I, I also agree um, that uh, I think it was... Um, Gemma Miller that brought up the concern with the, the trees, and I think that only adds to uh, the potential, uh, if you will, disruption or mitigation of some of the noise that could come from the facility 
um, and just the overall uh, aesthetic impact that the facility has. So if there's a way to, to see what the trees are that would be impacted and which ones exactly would be staying um, that meet the needs of our landscape plan, that would additionally be helpful. Um, so I think where I sit right now is I think we're in a position or I'm in a position of needing more information before I could um, decide one way or the other on this application before us tonight. Um, and so uh, th those are my comments. Are there uh, any additional from uh, commissioners? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know, Mr. Centenario, or perhaps one of the uh, engineer staff, um, how much time would they need to be able to remodel this uh, overlaying existing conditions? Mr. Markegaard or Mr. Centenario? And if we continue this, do something, it would be a date certain, and we want to make sure we give them enough time to do that. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, uh, you know, our, our next meeting is already uh, October 22nd, and uh, the packet would be distributed distributed to you next week. Uh, so I'd, I'll let the applicant uh, add their two cents, but um, I think it would hard to it would be hard to add this additional information and provide it to you within a, within a week. Maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, if not October 22nd, then it, the next meeting after that would be November 5th. So maybe that's a more appropriate uh, timeline to allow the applicant to study this further. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Um, and that is Mr. Chair, and um, just to confirm from staff, that's within our uh, our actionable time window. Sure, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Roman, we have the ability to extend the agency action timeline to 120 days, and we haven't done that yet. And so uh, if the application is continued for a few weeks, uh, we would we would do that, uh, but I, we would still be able to uh, work within the confines of the state law in terms of actionable timeline. Okay. Thank you. So, it, uh, Mr. Centenario, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, the 120-day law on this one, uh, does that take us out to December? Is that correct? Or Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, yes. Glenn, do you, have, do you have access to that? that I do, uh, Mr. Chairman. It takes us to December 29th. Okay. So we do have the ability then, um, I think, to Commissioner Roman's uh, question, we would have to make, since we have final decision authority uh, at the Planning Commission, we would have until that date to make a decision if to give the applicant more time to uh, do the modding, modeling, maybe work with staff on uh, the additional uh, landscaping or whatever else the, the Planning Commission would desire um, from that. So I, uh, again, um, at this point, we can continue discussion or um, it is possible to make a motion to continue the public hearing. Uh, I would prefer that we have a date certain uh, to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll throw that out to the, to the commission for thoughts. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Markegaard and Mr. Centenario, um, I heard November 5th, um, then am I to assume the next meeting after that would be, be November 19th? Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. Uh, November 5th and then November 19th. And uh, in your opinion, November 19th um, would be sufficient time to get the depth of information that you, you're hearing, I think, from the commission uh, around trees, around noise, around generator uh, use? Yep, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, uh, certainly the landscape plan uh, could be, it sounds like the applicant has already done some work uh, based on staff's comments, so I, I believe those uncertainties could be addressed. But frankly, I'd, I'd have, to, we, I think we should ask the, the applicant's engineers to see uh, if they'll be able to uh, do the additional work within the next few weeks, uh, and then we can figure out if it's the 5th or the 19th is a more appropriate date. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Centenario. Uh, Mr. Markgaard, do we have to um, open the public hearing to talk to the applicant at this point, or can we no, direct Mr. a question? Chairman, if you have a direct question, you do not. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe we can go back to that directly, and I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be um, Mr. Schmidt or uh, Mr. Baxter. Um, if you're available, how long would it take to do the additional modeling that you're hearing from the Planning Commission? Yeah, this is Tony Baxter again with ESI. Um, it depends on what information we need to gather from the site and the existing, um, the existing kit, uh, equipment and, and how quickly we can get that. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I can give you an answer on that right now. Um, two weeks uh, is, is probably um, is probably a little bit tight to get the work done. Um, uh, so, but um, I, I think that's that's the the best answer probably I have right now. Okay. It seems, it seems a little bit tight, but because there's a lot of information we're going to have to gather. All right. So, uh, Mr. Uh... Just to, to continue on this line, um, Mr. Markegaard, uh, Mr. Centenario, uh, assuming, let's just assume a November 19th deadline, how, how long before that do you need your information? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one consideration too is this is subject to appeal to the city council and we would need to give the city council at least two meetings. Okay. Uh, and to give them two meetings after a potential appeal, uh, this would need to come November 5th at the latest. Okay. Unfortunately, November 5th is a very, very crowded uh, meeting. There are a lot of items on the agenda, but uh, given the 120 day timeline, unless the applicant uh, were willing to extend the 120 day time limit, uh, we would need uh, not to go past November 5th. Okay. But we can ask the applicant if they are willing to do so. All right. So I guess that uh, understanding that the November 5th is a very packed meeting already, Mr. Pannebecker, um, would you be willing to extend that uh, so that the Planning Commission can have a uh, thorough discussion of your application and send it to the city council? Well, my concern is, and I know if the meeting's on the 5th, the information has to be provided uh, well before that. So that really cuts us back into uh, the amount of time that we have to, like, uh, to gather the information and, and uh, model it and get everything published and, and distributed. So my concern is that uh, you know, we would not have enough time to make this the middle deadline for to, to, to get in for everything you want for that meeting, particularly on the sound level. Uh, so I'm not sure that we have an option at this point. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm Mr. Markergerd. I'm assuming there's probably paperwork that the applicant would have to address um, with the city in order to extend the 120-day uh, law, the 60-day law. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Um, first of all, I want to confirm with uh, Mr. Uh, Pennebecker, is Verizon willing to extend that agency action deadline? I would have to confirm that with them uh, uh, and, and make sure that they were comfortable with that. Okay. All right, so... Um, Mr. Markergaard, it sounds like um, at the very least we would continue this till our next planning commission meeting to get an answer back um, to confirm or um, either one way or the other from Mr. Pannebecker um, if Verizon is willing to extend. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that uh, there is another Verizon item on your next agenda, so um, I would recommend continuing two weeks just so that we can uh, determine the exact date. And I think the discussion in two weeks would be simply to uh, determine which date it comes back with the 
noise right. study. Sure. And what is that uh, date specific? The 22nd. 22nd. October 22nd. Okay. All right. Hearing that discussion, Planning Commission members, is there anybody willing to make a motion to continue this public hearing until the October 22nd Planning Commission meeting? Commissioner Roman. Mr. Chair, I move to continue this item to the October 22nd, 2020 meeting of the Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. I have a motion to continue the public, public hearing until the October 22nd Planning Commission meeting. Is there a second, Commissioner Goldsman? I second. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second uh, to continue the public hearing until the October 22nd Planning Commission meeting. All those in favor say aye. A roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself. That's unanimous. This, uh, the public hearing uh, for this uh, application will be continued until the October 22nd meeting, at which time the intent at this point is to discuss uh, the applicant's ability to continue uh, the public hearing um, and give permission for the uh, city to consider after the December 29th um, deadline. All right. Hopefully I covered that sufficiently. Um, and I think we can move on to our next agenda item for the evening, Mr. Centenario. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioners, the next item on your agenda is really switching gears quite a bit to a uh, privately initiated code amendment. And so uh, this is not a staff driven or planning commission driven amendment. This was applied for by uh, Luther uh, dealership and they would like to modify sign standards for class one uh, new uh, motor vehicle sales facilities. So we had quite a bit of uh, back and forth with the applicant, a lot of uh, discussion on what uh, what they felt they need to operate their business and what staff, uh, what we could come before you and support. And so that's what uh, that's what we're here to present to you tonight. And my computer's freezing up a little bit, so please bear with me. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Okay, so um, to be clear, the sign amendments that we're gonna discuss tonight are citywide. And so we have uh, within the city, a number of class one motor vehicle facilities. The impetus for the application of course is uh, Luther Subaru Acura. Luther, uh, the Subaru dealership is under construction, well under construction. And uh, the sign package that uh, they would like to install on the, on the building uh, is not compliant with current standards. And so uh, they're, they're seeking to amend those standards to, um, to install what, what they believe is, uh, is an appropriate amount of signage on the, on the building. So what I have before you is, is just a, an image as it was. Uh, this is, if you went out to there today, it would look a lot different because the Subaru building is uh, uh, substantially complete and the building in the background, which was originally going to be the Subaru building is has been demolished. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like before. And we'll get into uh, just as examples to talk about how the standards would change uh, use uh, building elevations for the Subaru building itself, as it will be uh, completed. So uh, to identify kind of how the how this kind of came about, and its relationship to city code as it currently is written, we have uh, Acura and Subaru, uh, two independent dealerships, both owned by Luther, but independent dealerships on one overall site. And so here's the site plan uh, that was approved by the planning commission. And so we have Subaru uh, closer to 494 and Acura to the Southwest. And then the areas in between our inventory, uh, you know, uh, customer parking, um, and service uh, service parking. The site does extend uh, to the south to American Boulevard, uh, former um, uh, auto repair or uh, I believe it's a auto body uh, repair facility. Uh, the plan is to demolish that eventually uh, once uh, the Subaru building 
uh, is completed. So this is this is the final product uh, that's in process now. And when we have uh, a large development, we often have what's called a uniform sign design. Uh, and that uniform sign design, or USD for short, identifies all the signage that's on site. That includes freestanding signs, on-building signs, directional signs, and smaller on-building signs called in incidental signs. And so in the context of an Audrey dealership, when you drive up to a dealership for, to get an oil change and you look for the service sign on the building, that's an in incidental sign. And so we account for that in city code and we uh, require that uh, uh, applicant include that in their uniform sign design. So the current standard for dealerships is that each site, meaning both dealerships in this case, is limited to 300, 350 square feet for the entire site. Uh, that's quite restrictive uh, to accommodate signage for uh, two dealerships. And uh, what we are proposing is to eliminate uh, that site-based maximum, uh, the 350 square foot per site, and move towards uh, per building allowance, uh, which is uh, throughout the most of the sign code is what we is what we have. And I'll get into more detail on, on what that looks like. But first, uh, I'll touch on freestanding signs, uh, more specifically the, the, the primary um, freestanding sign, uh, which could be monument or um, pylon style signs. So before you, on this graphic, I, I have four um, dealerships within the city of Bloomington uh, depicting uh, monument style signs. And so what we're proposing uh, is in, elsewhere in the city code, we kind of incentivize the monument style sign a little bit uh, and what we're proposing is to allow a 30 foot foot sign in height, but a 100 square foot maximum in area. Uh, and so uh, the current standard is the first sign or if, on one street frontage, you only get one sign, but can be 30 feet in height, but 175 square feet in area. If you have multiple frontages, you are permitted a second freestanding sign, but that can only be 20 feet in height. Uh, and what we, we wanna have a little more consistency. Uh, so we believe that uh, both signs, if uh, desired by the, the owner, uh, could be 30 feet in height and 100 square feet uh, in area. Another image of different a different style of freestanding sign. This is a pylon style sign where essentially the the support structure, the uh, uh, you know the the structural element of the sign is, is more visible. It doesn't have the, that base or the skin, if you will, uh, which hides the support structure. So uh, what we're proposing, and, and this is pretty pretty consistent with other areas of the the code, is to slightly reduce the sign area for a pylon style sign. Uh, and drop that down to 75 square feet. Uh, we still wanted to maintain the height allowance, uh, given that, uh, and we do have, uh, given the current standards, we do have some pylon style signs that are up to 30 feet. Uh, so we wanted it to really limit uh, the potential of nonconformities, uh, but we do wanna provide a little bit of an incentive for uh, the monument style sign, which the code prefers. For you uh, on this graphic, uh, a lot going on here, obviously, but uh, dealerships have a lot of uh, corporate standards, and that's and that's part of the reason why uh, folks like Luther want to do what they want to do because the uh, the manufacturer has certain expectations. And uh, here's a whole bunch of different freestanding sign options, and these are all um, pylon style options. Uh, and I have uh, in the upper left, uh, 100 square foot. Uh, pylon style, which would not be permitted under the, pro pro the proposed standards, uh, but all of them would be permitted if they were monument style signs. Whereas in the upper right, you see a 75 square foot pylon style sign, all of those would be permitted uh, under the proposed standards. Going to the Subaru signs, uh, the, well, essentially the only sign that would, could not be permitted is the largest sign on the screen, which is the lower right. Uh, would it, because it's beyond 100 square feet. But other than that, uh, all of these options would be acceptable, uh, largely either pylon or monument. 
This is an image showing the, uh, the building elevation for Bloomington Acura as it exists today. Uh, there's very little signage on the building. We see a small uh, building sign along the west elevation, and that this is facing Lindale. Uh, there's a couple of uh, incidental signs on the, on the building, uh, but very limited. And uh, we'll let the applicant uh, give us an update on the timeline, but their intent is after the Subaru dealership is complete, uh, they'll be working towards a major remodel of this of this facility. And I think it's fair to assume that as part of that remodel, they're going to want to update their, their freestanding and on-building signage. And so we expect that to change where uh, we only have one small on-building sign. Uh, we expect that they're going to want more signage on the building. Um, and uh, these amendments uh, would meet their expectations. So here are some images of what the applicant would like to do uh, on their uh, Subaru building. And so the upper image is a north elevation and the, the lower um, image is the south elevation. So the, the south elevation points towards American Boulevard, the north elevation directs towards 494. And the current standard allows uh, up to or 150 square feet in on-building signage. We are proposing to shift that to a proportion standard similar to other areas in city code and that proportion to be 6%. So this is actually less than uh, a retail allowance, uh, but uh, we feel the 6% is uh, inappropriate and uh, uh, attractive, frankly, uh, allowance for signage that allows the applicant to, to install what they uh, what they would like, but then also doesn't open the door too far or where we have some proportionality issues where you have very large signs on, on, on buildings that could uh, clutter up the, um, you know, the public realm. And then the south elevation, which in this case would be a secondary elevation, you get a little less signage on a secondary elevation. Would, uh, the current standard is uh, 100 square feet and we are proposing to shift that to 4% of a building elevation. Again, less than a, a retail uh, situation, but still a greater allowance than what's permitted today, uh, almost universally. Uh, but then again, not opening the door too far where, where we feel you could have some aesthetic impacts uh, for a building. And so it, it's really easy to get in the weeds on signage, um, especially on signage types, combination of signage types, how you calculate the area of different signs, how you, how you calculate the area of different sign types within larger signs. Um, so just to give you a, a kind of a, a clue into what we, what we do uh, when we're reviewing signs, the images on the screen are a combination type. Uh, and this is, this is increasingly common where you have a portion of the sign, which is what we call cabinet. Uh, in this case, the, the Subaru star cluster and then a portion of the sign is individual letter or channel letter, the Subaru on the sign. And that, that's pretty common uh, where you have a retailer or some sort of uh, company that has a logo. Oftentimes it's easier to have that logo as a, a cabinet. It doesn't have to be, uh, but, some, but it, it is pretty common. And then you have the name uh, of the company as individual letter. And, that, and that's what we see before us here. This type of combination is not permitted currently uh, in city code for dealerships. Uh, we are proposing to allow this combination and allow the proportion of cabinet sign to the total area. So in this case, the yellow box to the entire sign or the red dashed area uh, to 33% or about a third. And so elsewhere in the code, that's limited to 25%. Uh, we run into a lot of proposals that are inconsistent with that 25%, but we think this, you know, roughly one third uh, is a good proportion and uh, uh, are proposing that uh, for auto dealerships. Now, going on to murals, um, which again, fairly unique, murals generally are permitted on, uh, on buildings and uh, they're, they're considered a secondary exterior material so there is an allowance for it. And as part of Subaru's building, they, they 
did show uh, an area for a mural. They did not show exactly what that mural would look like. And so we had a lot of discussions with the applicant on you know, what are what is your intent with that. And so a colleague in our office just photoshopped a, a lifestyle image, I think they like to call it, of, uh, of what could hypothetically be incorporated into this mural area. And, uh, you know, I've owned, I'm now on my third Subaru, so I'm, I'm fairly familiar with these lifestyle images. Um, but, you know, it, they have a certain branding image, you know, uh, outdoorsy or, um, you know, if you buy a Subaru, you're going to kayak more or something. Um, but that's that's kind of what we anticipate uh, what would be incorporated into that. What gets more complicated, though, is when you have a car or a tagline or some sort of commercial image within that mural, we consider that to be signage. And so while we want to add some flexibility, we also don't want it to look like a billboard. And so what we're proposing to do is I just grabbed an image off the web of a Subaru and this lifestyle image, you know, some young fit people camping. Uh, and if you take this whole image uh, on screen as the mural, this would be the dashed red would be the sign component component. And so we're proposing that uh, this would be permitted, but that area in this graphic counts towards your, your total allowance of signage. So you get the 6% on the north elevation, uh, but you need to think ahead and give yourself some allowance uh, so you stay within that 6%. Um, so again, we feel like that, that strikes a good balance with allowing flexibility for the applicant to do creative things uh, for their business, but still has a limitation where we're not, you know, we're not promoting uh, billboards on the sides of buildings along 494. Lastly, uh, there are also incidental and directional signs uh, on sites. You know, the small signs we have them at City Hall, they're, they're pretty ubiquitous, where you have different uh, texts directing you in a particular way uh, so you can, you can find your way throughout a site. That's pretty important uh, in an auto dealership, especially at, at Luther uh, Subaru Acura, given you have two different dealerships on the same site. It could be confusing for customers uh, to know where they're supposed to go, so directional signs are important. But then also incidental signs are pretty restrictive now. You're permitted one incidental sign per subject. So if you look at the image on screen where you have an express and then you have two service, uh, one on each uh, above each door, uh, there would only allow be permitted one service uh, sign, for example. And so that could, that could potentially be a little confusing for folks. So what we're proposing is just to, um, to use the general incidental sign standard uh, elsewhere in city code. Uh, so this sort of scenario would be permitted, uh, but there's still a maximum number and that's an, that's an acreage based, uh, two, two incidental signs per acre. There's no change proposed for the directional signs. I just wanted to bring it up because it, it is a component of site signage uh, and, it, and it does have an impact on um, how these things play out. So uh, with that, we are, we are recommending a approval of the draft ordinance that's, that was in your packet. Uh, I know the applicant is with us, and uh, they may wish to to add some um, some comments. But I'm certainly available for questions too. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Are there any questions um, for staff? I have one just quick question, and and it goes back to that mural um, that you just had up, Mr. Centenario. So the sign area is that calculated then, as in that particular instance, right? um with the subaru on it um it's it's a geometric shape it's not a. it doesn't follow the outline of whatever might be identifiable as a as the subject yeah mr chair the city code is, is actually quite explicit on how we're supposed to measure and we're not uh, in the business of trying to follow the precise outline of a, a vehicle in this case uh and so the city code tells us to draw a box around it and measure that box and so, uh, roughly speaking, uh, if we had a scale, I could tell you how many square feet that box is, and that's the amount of that's the sign area that would uh, would count towards their allowance. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions for staff? All right. Um, is the applicant available, Mr. Markegard, to speak to this? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. The applicant is here, and they can unmute and speak. 
Thank you, Glenn. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, this is Peter Beck. Um, I'm here with uh, Linda McGinty with um, Luther Companies and uh, Steve Sabraski, her uh, consultant engineer on all these projects. Um, uh, mostly, we just want to thank the staff for working with us on this. Um, we presented these amendments primarily just as a matter of treating the, the dealership uh, consistently with the other uh, commercially zoned properties along the 494 corridor. Um, think home furniture, Home Depot, that those kinds of things. Um, it didn't seem appropriate or fair that just because of the type of business, we would have a, a fraction of the signage that those other commercial businesses had, uh, particularly since we had been rezoned through city initiative to the commercial zoning district. So um, we appreciate that that, that um, philosophy or that point resonated with the staff and, uh, and the amendments um, that are being proposed by staff track what will work for us. So we're supportive of the staff recommendation. Um, we did have one clarification, Mike, I don't know, did you get the email today about the, um, um, some of the, uh, you, know, you know, Mike and the staff have pulled up some of the um, Subaru lifestyle images and um, we agree entirely that the mural should not be used to convey a commercial message. We're not asking that, that there be, uh, well, for instance, the one that was shown with the car in it and the logo on it and everything else, we agree. That should be signage, the box around that. But a few of them have, for instance, interior shots of uh, kids in the back seat or, um, or of a uh, dog in the window or, um, you know, the dogs or kids uh, behind, you know, sitting in an open tailgate. So we didn't think those conveyed a commercial commercial message, and we weren't sure if they were covered within the language of the, of the <coughs> proposed ordinance that says images of a motor vehicle aren't allowed. So we had suggested perhaps something along the lines of images that include a motor vehicle identifiable as a specific brand. Um, in other words, for instance, the photo that Mike showed with the box around, that's identifiable as a Subaru, certainly. That's signage, that's a, conveying a commercial message. But some of those other ones that we sent with the kids and the dogs and all that, um, this isn't a life or death issue for us. I mean, it uh, would give us a wider range of possibilities to work with Subaru's um, uh, inventory of images. Um, and and we don't think it would be contrary or adverse to the intent of the of the ordinance with respect to murals is as long as it's you know there might be a part of a car there the interior of a car but it, it you, know, you couldn't tell what kind of car it is so that that was the only comment request for clarification that we had other than that as I said we um, we support the amendments as proposed and appreciate the uh, ability to work with uh, the staff and the planning commission uh, to, to bring the signage standards for the auto dealers into more consistency, still less, but more consistent with uh, similar commercial uses in the zoning district. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Did uh, any of the, the other two uh, with you have any comments for us? Hi, uh, this is Linda McGinty. The only thing I would like to add um, is what Peter has already stated um, so well. We are um, just extremely grateful that um, staff has um, taken this um, and pretty much brought it into this century with um, the size of these buildings getting much larger in scale and allowing the signage to more accurately be depicted um, so that they don't look like they're dwarfed on the building. Um, we, we are, again, extremely grateful and um, we also appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Centenario, I did, just to follow up on uh, Mr. Beck's question, um, the the email that he sent today 
um, and the comment regarding images of a specific idea as a brand. Um, do you do you have any comments to that, Mr. Chair? I you know uh, as can imagine with the first item on our agenda, uh, busy day. Uh, so I didn't I didn't review uh, the email uh, that the applicant provided uh, today, and and frankly. I don't think I'd be in a position to to provide much much clarification regarding uh, intricacies of what could be considered a commercial message or what couldn't. A lot of a lot of the challenge with sign code is that you know there's there has to be some level of interpretation, uh, and uh, it, it's just the reality of of signage. Um, and you might have uh, three people that, that come to a, a different conclusion uh, on how something is consistent or inconsistent. Uh, so I, I frankly can't provide any additional clarification other than, uh, you know, generally speaking, if, if we can come to the determination that it's uh, commercial in nature, it's going to be considered signage. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Planning Commission members, any questions for the applicant? All right, uh, Mr. Markegaard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Beck, Ms. McGinty, and uh, Mr. Sabosky. Uh, Mr. Markegaard, anybody else uh, on the phone for this application? Mr. Chairman, we had nobody register in advance, um, but let me check in with Mr. Pease just okay. to confirm. Um, there are no phone calls. All right, All right. thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Planning Commission members, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Roman? Moved. All right, we have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Albrecht? Second. There's a second. All right, we have a motion and a second in front of us to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. By uh, roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself. Mo the uh, motion passes. Public hearing is now closed. Uh, now, discussion. Planning Commission members? Just a couple of thoughts. I think um, here from had the discussion earlier this week with staff, and I really appreciate the fact that they've worked hard with the applicant on this one and really tried to... Uh, come to a, an agreement that I think we all uh, may agree makes sense for these types of facilities. And I, I did kind of put Mr. Centenario on the spot with that question, but I do know it's very difficult to determine what is, a, what is brand or what is identifiable. Um, and I think where that's landed at this point is, is uh, about as good as we get. I, I do want to remind staff, I, I believe, we have a uh, the sign um, ordinances is, is on our work plan for the year, so uh, we do have an opportunity to revisit this uh, through that as well. Um, and so, uh, I think I can I can support this application, knowing um, that we've there's been a lot of effort into this. It it seems to make sense. I, I'm pleased at the. The mural discussion, I think that's a, a good opportunity uh, for some of our businesses, um, our auto dealers out there to convey uh, other messages um, with their brand. So, uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I would agree with the, many of the things that you stated. The, the things that I wrote down that I thought were uh, really good um, considerations from city staff and, and will be um, supporting this is that there's a per building um, allowance versus a per site allowance as we're using these sites a little bit differently, multiple buildings. Um, I like that they're making that consideration um, as well as um, having the signage be a percentage of the building size. So I really think that 6% um, signage um, on a building, it caps it, but it also makes sure that it is um, in proportion with this, with the um, size of the building. And, and um, so I really appreciate that change to the code as well. So 
all in all, I think it's a good um, good change, more consistent, and it'll be uh, easier for us to review um, signages uh, for throughout the city for for these auto dealerships. So, all in all, thanks, staff, for for this hard work. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Commissioner Crookton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't repeat what's already been said, but I'm generally in favor of the application before us. Uh, I think uh, all, of, all of this seems reasonable, with the exception of one thing that gives me a, a bit of pause is the ratio of the cabinet and channel signage going through to a one-third, two-thirds ratio. The existing commercial buildings uh, in our city have to record to the one-quarter, three-quarter ratio. And um, I think it's a bit of a slippery slope when we start pushing the boundary of that if we prefer channel signage in our city, although going from one quarter to one third is not much, all of a sudden one third becomes 40% and 40 becomes 50%. And um, if we're trying to have auto dealerships conform to the same requirements as commercial properties, it would be my opinion that we should match that existing requirement of one quarter to three quarter. Um, it's not an overall deal breaker for me, but that is my thoughts on, on that part of the application. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Crookdown. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the um, comments that this is a, this is a well put together um, proposal. Um, I, I think you know, we've seen a, a few things, whether it's on this project or similar projects where, um, you know, it's often, often the grumbling is that the, the government process has gotten in the way of business. Um, and we've seen staff repeatedly work to help businesses succeed in Bloomington. And so I, I commend them for that. Um, to Commissioner Cook's comment about the ratios consistent, I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable observation. Um, since an arrow mentioned that it's been hard to meet the 25% in recent times. So perhaps, um, a solution is to adopt this two thirds, one third, one third, two thirds here, and then bring the rest of the city code into alignment through miscellaneous issues update later in the year. Um, but on the, on the balance, this is a, a good proposal and I can support it. Thank you. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep my my comments brief and just echo uh, what other commissioners have said. Um, going to be in in support of this, and I just want to thank staff for their hard work on this as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other commissioners with any comments or any additional thoughts? Um, otherwise, I would entertain a motion from one of the commissioners, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In case PL 2020-154, I move to recommend the City Council adopt an ordinance approving city code amendments to modify sign standards at Class 1 motor vehicle sales facilities as outlined in the attached ordinance. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. Uh, second, Commissioner Albrecht. Second. All right. We have a motion to approve or to recommend approval and a second. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself. Uh, motion passes. This will move on. Boy, I don't have my yeah. normal sheet. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it would move on to November uh, 9th City Council meeting All right. as a public hearing. All right, thank you. Moves on to the November 9th uh, City Council. And I got to log in here. So that uh, will move forward. And then we will move to, oh boy. You know, there's too many passwords. This is, this is why I need paper. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, item number three, consider approval of draft public commission Planning Commission meeting synopsis for August 13th. And the August 13th, um, all commissioners were present. I would entertain a motion to approve uh, the August 13th, 
20 Planning Commission synopsis. Commissioner Goldsman. Motion to approve and the list planning meeting synopsis. Thank you. And uh, looking for a second, Commissioner Roman. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye by roll call for approval of the planning August 13th, 2020 planning commission synopsis. I roll call Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself. Motion passes. August 13th, Planning Commission synopsis. All right. The next uh, Planning Commission synopsis is for September 10th, 2020. And Commissioner Goldsman, uh, you were absent, as well as Commissioner Corman and Commissioner Abdi. Although, um, so at this point, I will entertain a motion to approve. Uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the draft planning commission meeting synopsis of September 10th, 2020 as presented. Thank you. Commissioner Roman. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second to approve the September 10th, 2020 planning commission synopsis. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Commissioner Commissioner Goldsman was not in attendance. No. Abstaining. Commissioner Corman. Abstain. I wasn't either. Abstain. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself. Motion passes for the September 10th Planning Commission synopsis. And the final. Um, item in front of us is approval of the September 24th Planning Commission synopsis. Everybody was in attendance except myself. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the draft Planning Commission meeting synopsis of September 24th, 2020 as presented. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Corman. Second. All right. We have a motion to approve the September 24th Planning Commission synopsis and a second in front of us. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I will abstain from that vote as not being in attendance. And the September 24th meeting minutes is approved. And that... Uh, I would like to make one note uh, before I, um, we terminate the meeting tonight. And I did mention in our first agenda item that for the October 22nd um, meeting, the continuation of our first item, that that was looked at as looking for an answer. But we do not know the answer um, from the applicant at this point. So it could be a full meeting where the Planning Commission will decide the fate of the application. So I want to make sure the public is aware of that. I didn't mean to confuse the issue by saying we were only looking uh, for um, uh, uh, approval from Verizon to continue the public meeting. We may have to make a final decision at that point, so please do tune in. Uh, we appreciate the input uh, in that meeting. Thank you. And that concludes our meeting for tonight. Thank you.